Thank you for making the effort to be here uh, to continue the partnership uh, and uh, to learn a little bit more about what's going on. So I guess the title of my talk is The State of the School. That's easy. It's excellent and aspirational. Truly, by every measure, it's excellent. Admissions and enrollment for next year is in fabulous shape. The college admission process for the class of 2019 has been truly exceptional. The annual fund's on a record pace, thanks in part to many of you in this room. Uh, we anticipate nearly 100% participation by parents, which is extraordinary for a boarding school, and 45% participation by alumni. Uh, equally exceptional, in fact, it puts us in the company of the top two or three boarding schools in the country. So all that's good. We are aspirational. I just came back from two days in New York City, uh, spent most of the time yesterday morning putting the finishing touches on a campus master plan, which will which chart the, the uh, campus development for the next 25 years. Um, all it takes is money. We know what we want to do, we know what we need to do it, and we know how we're going to do it. So that's all great. Uh, we'll also add a dollar for every, uh, for every dollar we spend on bricks and mortar, we will spend uh, a, uh, we will raise a dollar for an endowment. Our endowment at the end of March was about $44 million uh, and growing. Uh, again, thanks to our alums and our parents and their support. Uh, and excellent management. Uh, the next, the next uh, plateau, we hope, will be closer to 80 million, um, and then 100 million, which will really allow us to do the things we want to do for financial aid and for faculty salaries. But the state of the school is really in our people, my faculty colleagues and staff colleagues and your children. So I'm going to tell you, spend most of our time telling you a brief story. And I think it represents the wisdom of our students and the way they work to create and maintain a healthy culture. You know, we have a program called the Culminating Experience for Seniors, known as CES. And a week ago, yesterday, uh, Chloe Robinson, class of 2019, did her CES right here titled Truth. And, uh, Chloe's goal was an inspiration in itself. In her words, I want to leave Millbrook better than I found it. I think this, is a kind, this kind of event does such a thing. My hope is that it makes you think. I hope it makes you think about yourself and your truth, the truth you hide and the truth you project. I liked especially this statement, which she ended with. I hope you see that what makes you cool is how many things you find interesting. Uh, the CES featured talks by seven students, two third formers, one fourth former, two fifth formers, and two sixth formers, and they stood alone, actually right here without these chairs around them, and uh, in front of many of their schoolmates and teachers, and they shared their stories. They told their, the truth that they wanted to share at that moment. They spoke of the challenges the challenges they face, the discomfort they feel, the ambitions they have and that others have for them, what they're learning, the insights they've developed, and really the lives they, at this point in their young lives, think they want to live. So their messages, and this is what we were privileged to hear and I really want to share with all of you. First, life is difficult. This from a 15-year-old. <clears throat> life is difficult and learning to manage the challenges and the expectations of others is essential. Second, learning to deal with discomfort is fundamental. Third, parents 
encouraging their children to be tough and successful is good. Again, that was from a 15-year-old. Fourth, while confidence can be encouraged, it must be earned, and that takes work. Fifth, have an open mind. And last and surely not least, choose optimism. Pretty remarkable, right? So, as I thought about this and as I reflected, here's the subtext of their messages. That adults, parents and teachers, have played a central role in their learning, in their development of these attitudes. They're listening, they're paying attention, and most important, they are relying on us together. So I came away from that night with an even stronger conviction that to accomplish our shared goal of preparing your children for college and lives of meaning and consequence in the 21st century requires this. We need to encourage our child your children, our students, to be ambitious, to be optimistic, to be positive, to be open-minded, to be tough, and to be brave. And for me, that means, and I think it does for all of you, and it certainly does for my colleagues, that we as parents need to be ambitious, we need to be optimistic, we need to be positive, we need to be open-minded, we need to be tough, and we need to be brave. A good friend of mine and an author, uh, a former longtime head of school who passed away recently, wrote in a book that the opposite is being afraid of our children and afraid for our children. We have to stop that. We have to stop that. It doesn't help them. So what I suggest is remember these three simple phrases and use them regularly. It will work out. It will work out. I bet your parents said that to you. My mother did to me. Yeah, I understand, but you can do this. You can do this. Give it time. <clears throat> It'll work out. You can do this. Give it time. So out of the mouth of babes, we heard these remarkable, remarkable lessons. Uh, I was privileged to be there. I wanted to share that with you. Life is difficult. Learning to deal with discomfort is essential. Parents encouraging a child to be tough and successful is good. While confidence can be encouraged, it has to be earned. Have an open mind and choose optimism. Such good stuff. So now I'm happy to answer any questions you have. <laughs> Thank you. That's nice. I was just repeating the things your children do. Hey, Drew, are you going to post that somewhere online? I would be delighted to. Um, I can do a couple things I'll think about. I can just send it to you all as a push page, which is easiest, or I can, yeah, we'll, we'll send it to you as a link, and you can do what you want. Good. Anything else? What do you see as the biggest challenge facing the school? Well, I've said it before. I, the biggest challenge facing schools, not just this school, and uh, I think teenagers, adolescents today, is parental anxiety. And I, I, in the fall, spoke about it. You're a generation that is being preyed upon 
by businesses that are trying to keep you afraid. And I do hope you just sit down and think about that for a while. You just let yourself reflect on that. And, if, and, and think about it when you watch a, a hysterical weather report. <laughs> Every weather report's hysterical. 40 million, 40 million people in danger. Right? I mean, it's going to rain. It's going to snow in the Northeast. Um, why? Because that sells average, because it brings watchers in and it, it promotes advertising. I mean, everything. And then, again, most important, you are trying to parent your, the iGen through an iPhone. And I think the single biggest difference is your children are telling you how they feel constantly when they don't even know, by the way, how they feel. <laughs> really, they don't. They just send it out there uh, in an instant through a phone, which you then get, and you have no idea what to do with that because no one has ever had to deal with that before. Again, think about that. You are the first generation of parents to have to deal with that. And how do you deal with it? You feel compelled to respond, which is probably the worst thing to do. Unless you say, it will work out. <laughs> you can do this. It will take time. And then I would add, who are you going to talk to at Millbrook about that? So here's an example. your son or daughter doesn't get the part in the play that they want, or they get cut from a team, or they get their first disappointment. If you engage with that, and you engage with it in the wrong way, it actually robs them of the responsibility to deal with it in ways that they should, particularly if you begin to place blame on the person who didn't do for them what they wanted that person to do. You don't, you know, that's how you earn confidence, by going back, by doing drafts, by, you know, by rewriting, by sticking with it, by playing on the JV and working your way up to the varsity. So I see this as the biggest challenge, and my heart is with you all. Because your parents had no idea how you felt most of the time. <laughs> and I might add, nor did they particularly care. And lastly, and perhaps more, most important, that was a good thing. It was a good thing for each and every one of you. Um, and I think we have to give your children, our students, that same gift and those same reminders. Because they're anxious, they feel it. It's all around them. But they're going to get into college, and then they're going to graduate, and then they're going to find a job, and then they're going to work hard to make a life going to work. Maybe we should stop there. <laughs> Drew, are you guys making, based on sort of ongoing research and stuff, are you making any adjustments to best practices with regard to screen time, iPhone usage, things like that? Yeah. And uh, we, we look at that uh, daily, and then we also will sit down at the end of the year and say, what needs to change? As you've heard me say, we are constantly trying to find the intersection between education and legislation. So I did dorm duty two Thursday nights ago in Harris Hall, the third form boys dorm, and boys are checking in and they're putting their phones in their slots. Um, and so the third and fourth formers you know, have to put their phones away. And uh, there are places where students are on campus and you're not supposed to have your phones. Those of you who have daughters, would you please find them dresses with pockets? <laughs> uh, I'm tired of taking their phones away at formal dinner, my advisees. Um, uh, but so we'll sit down and look at it again. Uh, and it's, it's constant. You know, it's just as it's a challenge for you, or I would say just as it's a reality for you as parents, it's a reality for us as a school. We have to constantly look at this. But I will say again, the immediacy, I was struck. Um, uh, some of your children did a midnight run in New York City on Thursday night where they have three stops and they provide uh, clothing and toiletries and food for homeless. And I was fortunate enough with John Downs to be in New York City that night. So we went over to 
9th, I think it was 9th Avenue and 41st Street and, and move with them. They were fabulous engaging, uh, engaging men and women who were in real need and talking to them. But the minute that was over, they were taking pictures of each other and sending them all over. And I often wonder what happened. Where do they go? What are those, you know, because some of them were of me with them. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, um, yes, we're constantly thinking about that. Yep. Uh, hi, Jim. I think Good morning. I recall, you talked about the theme of the year was respect. Mm -hmm. So how did that resonate with the students? What concrete things did they do to bring it up? Well, again, I think uh, Chloe's, right, Chloe's CS was all about that. And having students stand here and having others respect them and listen to them. We've had a number of chapel talks on the topic. Uh, we have had speakers here to talk about it and about sensitive topics, one, mental health. Um, so I think by, by bringing tough subjects in front of the community and asking them to listen and think with respect, and then it has resonated all throughout the curriculum in different ways. And the Midnight Runs, again, a perfect example of showing respect to a population that's often just ignored and doing our part for that. Are we on time? Oh boy. Rick. So uh, the, the two largest facility needs uh, are to add on to Mills Athletic Center, which was designed for uh, 275 students, and we now have 325 students. Uh, and we need to add a field house to that, which would include two basketball courts, uh, proper fitness center and locker rooms and other support facilities. That's important because that, the facility as it exists now creates a log jam everywhere in the community. We would like to start the academic schedule later. We'd like to start the day later. Can't do that because of the narrow, we only have one basketball court, therefore we have to fit four basketball teams on. Um, uh, we uh, would like to make the start of study hall sacred and not have practices uh, 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 spill over into that. Again, expanding that facility will allow us to do that. We're also going to have to put lights on one of the fields so that we can have practices late in the fall. So expanding athletics, which actually will help academics, the daily schedule, and residential life. Uh, and I think in that way also campus health. Um, and then second, we want to build a new boys dorm uh, to complete the quadrangle at the west end of the campus. Uh, and that allow us to do a number of things. One, it will give us an excellent boys dorm. Two, it will allow us to move uh, boys out of other spaces that we can then renovate. And uh, in the short term, we want to go, we're 275 boarders now and 45 day students. We would like to go to 290 boarders and 30 day students going forward. Um, and we'd like some flexibility in there. So a dorm and, the, uh, uh, and adding on to the athletic center. And then, and then endowment, because endowment, as I said, goes to financial aid, which we would like to continue to increase to grant access uh, to the community and to compensation for faculty and staff. One more. Okay. Uh, that's great. Boy, can I do that in two minutes. So um, uh, you may know that we have a truly wonderful relationship with the Right to Dream Academy in Ghana. And we have five students here, three, boy, uh, three girls and two boys. And uh, they, as an organization, have been trying to develop uh, corporate sponsorships with Nike and Coca-Cola. And uh, they sent, out of all the students, they must have 60... 80 students in American boarding schools and colleges. Uh, they chose two of our current seniors, Osani Buddha and Adelaide Amra, to speak to the Nike executives in, uh, I think it was Denmark. And they did that, and they did so well that they were invited then to go to Portland to speak to the next level of Nike executives. And they added one of our graduates, Edward Apoku, who went to the University of Gen Virginia and now plays I think it's called the, the Columbus Crew for the MLS, plays professional soccer. And so of all the people they could have chosen, they chose two Millbrook students and one Millbrook graduate, and they crushed it. 
They crushed it. I haven't gotten an answer yet, but here's what I will tell you. Uh, Tom Vernon, the head of Right to Dream, the founder, was here staying with us with his wife and son because he would like his son to come to Millbrook. They would like their son to come to Millbrook. And the Nike Adelaide wrote a poem about what the swoosh means to her, which is hope because girls in Ghana have no opportunity. And this meant hope to her. That poem Nike wants to put on the desks of all their soccer employees. And I said to Tom Vernon, yeah, that's okay if Nike gives you their sponsorship. If not, what does Adelaide get? Right. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm around. I'm happy to answer questions. Have a great rest of the time.